Okay, so that was a quick introduction to conservation paleobiology. And I thought now I would like to go on and look at some examples where without fossils, we would draw erroneous conclusions about biotic change, vulnerability and resistance in this um, conservation framework. So bear this in mind to an, it to an extent for what it is. It's a case for the importance of the deep time approach that conservation paleobiology is based around. It's a pitch that I find compelling, but then I probably would do because I'm a paleobiologist, right? And we like to think that we can provide useful insights with fossils. I encourage you to view it as a pitch um, to highlight the usefulness of fossils um, and think about whether you agree with me. And bear in mind that this doesn't mean that other approaches aren't valuable. It just means that sometimes uh, we could use um, fossils possibly more than we actually do in conservation practice. So let's jump right into our examples and let's start by looking at invasive species. Often, when we read about invasive species in the news, say, these are couched in a great deal of certainty, but actually, in many cases, distinguishing native from non-native taxa can be something of a challenge for conservation. Indeed, the flora and fauna that characterised an area prior to human colonisation is typically fairly poorly known. For obvious reasons, fossils are thus very useful for documenting pre-colonisation biotas because those sample the ecosystem before humans were around. Turning to this resource has shown, for example, that some species that were once assumed to be exotic or uh, invasive may in fact be native. As an example, you can see in the middle here the screw pine and the beech cordia or sea trumpet on the right hand side here. And these were thought to have been introduced into Hawaiian islands by colonising Polynesians. But pollen and seed evidence recovered from coring and excavations in a large sinkhole and cave system, shown on the left hand side here, has actually shown that both of these were present in the islands for thousands of years before human arrival. And now these species are being used in coastal and dry forest restoration efforts in the Hawaiian islands. So fossils in this case are revealing something about what is native versus not native. To put modern changes into context, we typically also need to have an idea of the past mean of environmental factors in a given region. We can call this the historical range of variability or HRV. And we may want to use this as a management target in conservation. So the historical range of um, environmental factors in the past is a very good place to pitch where we should be today. Long-term records from, for example, cores, if they are good, um, will have annual to decadal resolution, and those can be used to constrain both the variability and discriminate variability around the stationary mean um, in, uh, in the past of an area from variability associated with a long-term trend. My example here is, was published by Wolf et al. in 2001, and this is a team that studies sediment cores from two lakes in Colorado, Sky Pond in Colorado, shown on the left here, which is one of their lakes. And they showed an increase in um, diatom abundance. So these are diatoms, they're microfossils, um, which have salacious um, silicon dioxide hard parts. Um, they showed an increase, these authors, in diatom abundance, coupled with um, nitrogen depleted sediments, um, as shown on the graph on the right hand side here, to provide an indicator of the historical range of variability. And when we're looking at this graph here, I do encourage you to look actually at the scale on the x-axis and see um, this breadth of scale in the deep historical past down the core in these um, and the rate of change of diatom assemblages is dwarfed by the rate of change in diatom assemblages that's happened in the last few centimeters of core. These changes, the authors make the case, were driven um, by excess nitrogen derived from agricultural and industrial sources since the 1950s. So by looking at these cores, the authors have identified rate and magnitude shifts that far exceeded the historical variation, that that we see here, again bearing in mind the difference in the x-axis here, and the same is recorded in nitrogen concentrations. Um, so these changes that are driven by human activity since the 1840s are far in excess of the historical range of variation that we see in the past for these lakes. So that's a very, very useful thing to say. 
it can be challenging also to assess the impact of stress on biodiversity in modern ecosystems whilst they are being subjected to that stress. Estimates of species richness and diversity made using only live collected organisms can mislead, for example, when modern ecosystems have both exotic species coupled with an unrecognised loss of endemic taxa. An example that I've put on this slide for you here is by Bernie et al. and was published in 2008. And this was based on bone assemblages in a Madagascar cave, which is actually the cave that's uh, marked by a star just down at the bottom here. This study focused on the vertebrate community of the semi-arid spiny bushlands associated with that part of Madagascar. And the bonus assemblages that they studied sample this. So this is the kind of woodland and grassland and brushland you get in this area today. And these authors showed by looking at this cave deposit that the vertebrate community in these bushlands used to be far more diverse only a few millennia ago than they are today. There are key guilds, or groups of organisms that play an important ecosystem function that are now missing thanks to anthropogenic driven extinctions or range, contra range contractions. So by studying these fossils, we have identified um, a loss of endemic taxa. That's really, really useful. The fossil record is also key to understanding the dynamics of species populations and the ranges of species. In modern ecosystems, unless you continuously mon monitor um, species distributions, it can be difficult to spot declines in a species population that falls short of a local extinction. As such, most knowledge of temporal trends of abundance in modern ecosystems is limited to presence or absence data, or semi-quantitative estimates. But the fossil record provides valuable retrospective data about species and about areas of critical concern. I've put two examples on this slide here. The first is by Bernie et al. It was published in 2001. The, um, the reference is here for you. And these authors use plant fossil data from a cave excavation on one of the islands in Hawaii. The authors showed that rare plant species that are now restricted to remote mountain habitats on the island were widespread in the coastal lowlands before human colonization. So what we're seeing is a change in abundance and a change in range. Things that used to be uh, down here are now only visible up here in a, in a different kind of habitat. Paleoecological data can also be used to detect shifts in geographical range distribution of species in response to recent climate change. Emsley et al, um, there's a paper um, published in 1998, I put the reference for you here, use um, studied bones from breeding sites on Anivas Island in the Arctic Peninsula, and they showed that these sites were occupied exclusively by Adelie penguins through the Little Ice Age. Possibly I got that pronunciation wrong, I'm not quite sure. So between 1400 and 1850, um, there was just one species of penguin on this um, island. However, now we see the Gentoo and Chinstrap penguins are breeding there, and those, we realise from looking at the fossil record, have expanded their range, ranges into this region only within the past 50 years, presumably in response to climate warming. So this is an example where the fossil record helps us to understand um, shifts in climate and their impact. And I wanted to finish by highlighting that human perceptions are also important in this context. We're all humans, and I find how that colours our science really, really interesting. Tens of the many things I could have finished this video on, I chose this one. So we are all trapped in the present unless you've been watching sci-fi. So that's a thing that is, um, I think, fairly obvious to all of us. Expected norms for biodiversity and ecosystem services are set by what we as humans experience in the present. With successive generations, expectations can be altered and often diminished in response to the changes that we see. It thus requires efforts to counteract um, this diminishment, this effect that's sometimes called a shifting baseline phenomenon. We find it very, very difficult to, um, to maintain our expectations when, our ba when the world around us is changing. But historical information is key to informing experiential norms, so the things that we're exper experiencing. In this context, paleobiology and associated studies are very, very useful. They show us that ecological conditions have in fact changed. 
they can allow us to establish the timing of that change and thereby disentangle possible anthropogenic, so human-driven um, drivers from ones which may be natural. In the best cases, they can help us establish what was natural, or at least what biological conditions prevailed at some specific point in cultural history. With the caveat that natural is a moving target when we view it through a geohistorical lens, because of course things do change all the time. I said that at the beginning of the first video. The example here um, is this paper from 2009. These authors use paleontological evidence to show progressive diversion of the Colo Colorado River water over the 20th century and the impact that had on productivity in the, the northern Gulf of California, this region shown on the left hand side here. This um, includes the documented functional extinction of a key bivalve species that was reported in this paper and suppressed growth rates in the iconic fish, um, the Toeba McDonaldi, shown on the right hand side here. This fish is now critically endangered due to overfishing, as well as a series of other faunal effects. So the study provided the first science-based estimates of water flow across the US-Mexico border that will be needed to restore uh, some modicum of marine ecosystem services in response to the changes that they document. So I think it's a very, very interesting and good example. And that brings us to the end of this video. So I'll see you very shortly in the next one.